Welcome to Free Thinking 101. I'm Pat Innes, and tonight I, we're honored to have as a guest a visitor from India, Labanam. Labanam is the director of the Atheist Center in Vijayawada, India. Welcome back to the program, Labanam. Thank you. I'm really glad you could uh, make it again for Free Thinking 101, but tonight we're going to talk a little bit about atheism, atheism in India, atheism around the world, and just the history of atheism. That's good. <laughs> I understand that in India there's really a long tradition of atheism. Yeah, you're right. You see, from time immemorial, atheism has been a part and parcel of Indian culture. We have Sankhya philosophy, which is considered to be the ancient trait of Indian philosophy. And then we had ancient atheists, Charvakas and Lokayatas in India. And these ancient atheists whatever they promoted was considered to be social atheism in India. A ancient, what was that you were calling them? Charvaka and Lokayata. And mainly Charvakas and Lokayatas, by those known they went. Charvaka means, Charu means good, Vaka means words. Those who spoke good words to the people, oh. they were called Charvakas. They're sort of like some type of priests almost? Or Some of them might have come from the priest class, but most of them have come from the common people. Mm -hmm. You see, in India, because of the caste system, the Brahmins and Brahminism was suppressing many people. Even though the caste system originally started as division of labor, but later on, caste by birth. And because of caste by birth, and Hinduism is very much associated with caste system, there can be no Hindu without a caste, so the problem for Hindus from the uh, from ever we know about Hinduism has been that there is no conversion into Hinduism. Into Christianity they convert people, into Islam they convert people, into Zoroastrianism they convert people, into Judaism they convert people, but in Hinduism there is no conversion. That's why I jokingly say Hinduism has only in gate, it has only exit gate, it has no <laughs> in gate. That's why Hindus are very often very much disturbed that uh, Hindus are becoming Christians and Muslims, so Hindus are losing. But Hindus cannot gain as long as the caste system is there. Suppose you are converted into Hindu, into which caste you should be placed? Well, that's not a very tough decision. <laughs> oh, yes, you cannot choose your caste because you are to be born into a caste in India. So caste comes by birth. So Brahmins, Kshatriyas, they mm -hmm. are the rulers and the warriors then Vaishyas, they are the custodians of property and traders, then Shudras. So the Shudras were very much suppressed by the priestly class in those days and the priests. That's why the Charvakas and Lokayatas, Lokayata means Loka means word, Hita means goodness. Those who very much wished the goodness of the world and for the good of the society, those who work, they are called the Lokayatas. So the ancient Charvakas, they opposed the caste system, they opposed the tyranny of the Brahmins, they opposed the imposition of blind beliefs among the people. So these were the ancient atheists. They were there, I think, we don't know the time exactly, but maybe 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago. Then later on, Buddhism and Jainism are considered to be godless religions in India mm -hmm. because they did not believe in God. Of course, Buddhism was agnostic religion, whereas Jainism said there is no God. Whatever we have is the cycle of births and deaths. So that's how India has been a land of atheism also from the time immemorial. And uh, the atheist center in modern atheism is the most modern link in that history of atheism in India. Mm -hmm. Well, the Atheist Center actually was uh, founded about 50 years ago by your father, Gora. Yes. And can you tell me uh, what position your father had in the atheist movement in, in India? Yeah. You see, basically my father came from the field of education. My grandfather was a great religious leader. And so, as a kid, my father also was a part of uh, that religious tradition. And uh, in India, Shiva is one God and Vishnu is another God. So the followers of Shiva and the followers of Vishnu were quarreling among themselves. 
it may be equated like the Protestants and the Catholics. <laughs> so my grandfather took the view that Shiva and Vishnu are the two sides of the same coin called God. So why should we quarrel? So this kind of a liberal atmosphere among the Hindu philosophy, my grandfather accepted and my father also grew into that one. Then my father took his education, the western type of education, English education, and he studied science, botany and zoology. And this scientific education led him to question everything, not to accept anything without question. The more he questioned, the more he became an agnostic, and still more he questioned, he became an atheist. That's how, first intellectually, through quest of knowledge, he came to be an atheist. Once he thought he was an atheist, when he found he was an atheist, then he rebelled against the caste system. And my father was born into the highest caste, that was the Brahmin caste. So he renounced his caste and said, I am no more a Brahmin, I am a human being. All human beings are fellow human beings. And he rebelled against the caste system. Then he was sent out of the family and he was sent out of the uh, community. And twice he was uh, dismissed from the colleges for his atheism also because he was uh, propagating atheism. Then finally he resigned his job and then he started the atheist center. Then my father was a close colleague of Mahatma Gandhi, uh, working for the freedom of the country and promoting social reforms in India. So my father had talks with Mahatma Gandhi and atheism. They were published by the official Gandhian publications in the name of the book was published in the name of an atheist with Gandhi. Uh, and so my father became well known throughout the world because of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, with this one, when he started the Atheist Center, naturally people, uh, even though they did not like it in the beginning, but they started taking interest in it. And my father died in 1975, that 15 years ago. And ever since, we are nine children to my parents. My mother is still alive. And then she is 79, going great in health. And all the nine children of my parents are atheists. Mm -hmm. All our spouses are atheists. <laughs> all our children and grandchildren, they are all following the atheist way of life. So Atheist Center has a great army of atheists in our family. <laughs> and besides, we have several other atheists in Andhra Pradesh, where Vijayawada is situated. And uh, Vijayawada is in the South India. And then throughout the India, we have several atheists. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it, yeah, it looks like uh, there is a very vital, large vital atheist community in India. Uh, aside from the, the Atheist Center, could you describe some of the other activities that are going on? Yes. You see, two great uh, humanists and rationalists, of course, one of them called himself an atheist also, is Periyar E. V. Ramaswamy. He was born into a non Brahmin community. He also worked for the freedom of the country, and he was a social reformer. He rebelled against the domination of the Brahminical system. And then he led a great movement called Self-Respect Movement mm -hmm. in Tamil Nadu, Madras State, South India. And then that supported in turn the non-Brahmin politics in South India. And it may be of interest to our uh, viewers here that the present ministry in the Tamil Nadu, the government in the Tamil Nadu is by his followers. So the followers of Periyar E.V. Ramaswamy, uh, the, of the self-respect movement, they started Dravida Munnetra Kasagam, the, that is the Tamil word for it, the Dravidian progressive movement, and they have been in power. So oh. first time, atheists have come to power in South India, in Madras state, Tamil Nadu state. That's and, very interesting because uh, actually in the United States, I, I'm not really aware I, of any atheists holding public office right now. There probably are some. They don't make a, a big deal out of it. But in one state, I can't recall the state now, that, that there's actually a book on the law that if you are an atheist or if you don't have a belief in God, you can't hold public office. Is it so? That's true. Then how can America be the land of uh, freedom? <laughs> if there is no, you see, freedom of religion goes with the freedom of atheism. If there is no freedom for an atheist, then in that land there can be no freedom from religion also. Yes. Well, I think that that law actually will, in the 
course of being challenged right now, and I think it will be changed. I hope, I hope the American judiciary, the American politics, and then the American public, they will have enough uh, uh, the power of justice, and then they see that if they want to treat all people equally, then they should have equal respect and equal opportunity and equal freedom to atheists also. I think in America, atheists also enjoy some freedom and there are atheist organizations here also. Then coming back to that one is, besides Periyar's self-respect movement, another leader was M.N. Roy, Manavendranath Roy. He started as a terrorist in the freedom struggle of India in the early, uh, early part of the century. Then he came to the United States and he became a communist here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And then he went to Mexico. He started the first communist party outside Soviet Union in Mexico. Then from Mexico, he was invited by Lenin to Soviet Union. But after going to Soviet Union, he got uh, very much disillusioned with the communist movement. And then he became a kind of a non-communist. Then he moved to humanism. And then he started radical humanism. And then he was an atheist. And M. N. Roy's influence is there in India. So Periyar, M. N. Roy, and then Gora, my own father, Mm -hmm. Then another personality, Abraham Kovor, he came from the Christian background, came from Kerala, he migrated to Sri Lanka, he challenged the godmen of India, and he promoted the rational thought in India. Mm -hmm. So then coming to organizations, we have Indian Secular Society, we have Radical Humanist Association, we have Indian Racialist Association, we have Indian Humanist Union, besides the Atheist Center and the Self-Respect Movement. Yeah, I might, uh, I might show for some of our viewers some of the uh, the periodicals that you have here. Now here's the uh, yeah, magazine the, called the, the Atheist and that's uh, published uh, actually by, by your organization. Yes, by Atheist Center. Uh -huh. If we can get a shot of that, uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. You, uh, you have, a, have a lot of uh, interesting articles in there and also I guess you also publish some uh, information from uh, various other atheist organizations around? Yes, we do from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Because the Atheist Center is promoting world atheism also. Uh -huh. So representatives of the Atheist Center have been traveling all over the world. Uh -huh. And this is, uh, this year is the Golden Jubilee year of the Atheist Center. That is the 50 years of the Atheist Center. So in February when the Golden Jubilee function was held in Vijayawada, we published this souvenir and on the title are Gora and Mrs. Gora with their grandchild mm -hmm. going into the future. Then we have, this is uh, the Secularist, uh, published by the Indian Association of Secularism. So they have a Secularist magazine, and then this magazine is Indian Skeptic. This is published by the people who are challenging the miracle mind. Mr. Premanand is the editor of this magazine, Indian Skeptic. Mm -hmm. And then we have still, there is a Radical Humanist magazine, there is Modern Freethinker magazine, there is a Modern Rationalist magazine, and India has many local languages. And in most of the local languages, we have Rationalist, Atheist, Humanist magazines. Ra rationalistic. Rationalist magazines. Okay. okay. Well, the, you, know, you mentioned there for uh, a couple of minutes ago about the, the Godmen, you call them, yeah. that they have in India. And they're, they're kind of a, a colorful, interesting bunch of characters, aren't they? Can you tell us a little bit about them and the kind of tricks that they perform? Oh, yes. You see, uh, these Godmen, uh, the famous of the Godmen, Miracle Men, is Shai Baba. And the trick he performs is he brings, uh, it is said that he brings uh, Vipu the sacred ash from nowhere. But no, you see, he must be hiding it somewhere and then producing it. Then some of the sacred men, they walk on fire. So mm -hmm. it is said he had organized several wife fire walking demonstrations. And see, the miracle mind is a product of uh, number one, when people are frustrated, they seek outside in some supernatural power solution for their problems. So miracle mind is a product of people's frustration. And the second side, when there are people to deceive people and get benefited by cheating. Mm. So either if they are honest, they are frustrated. If they are honest, then I don't know how to call it, they are deceiving the people. So miracle mind has got the two sides. One side is frustration for the honest people and then they are the deceivers, fraud on the other side if they are not honest. So India, after independence, people had high expectations. 
Mm. They could not reach those expectations. Then they started seeking salvation in supernatural powers. For that, the palmistry, the astrology. Yeah. And I always tell people, when you went to uh, jail during the freedom struggle, you never consulted an astro astrologer that whether you would get six months jail term or <laughs> one year jail term. Just you went to jail. <laughs> then you never consulted an astrologer. Now why do you want to consult an astrologer? Yeah. That well, is because frustration. So thinking that they might, they might have been born in good stars or bad stars, and this kind of belief in supernatural and astrology, uh, they are um, very inimical for even economic development in India. Well, I guess they have this expression, it's, it's hard to cheat an honest man. And uh, I guess the, the idea is there is that if you're not really looking for something, for some loophole, right, I right. guess, in, in life, then right. you, you don't really fall into these right, traps. Right. I think these all we may call the social dishonesty, not mm -hmm. so much of individual dishonesty, but social dishonesty. The tragedy of the present day society is uh, there is more social dishonesty today in our mm -hmm. politics, in our social life, in our political life, in our economic life. And, be, and now social dishonesty is being internationalized everywhere. And I think India is exporting a lot of social dishonesty in the form of miracle mind to United States and then to Germany and to other places. Mm -hmm. I'm very sorry for it. Well, when you are buying it, what is wrong in there selling it to you? So I think when more people in the United States, they say, we don't want this kind of miracle mind here, your miracle mind, then it doesn't come here. Yes, well, that's, that's interesting because I guess there has been a, a flood, really, more so in, in recent years, uh, perhaps kicked off by the Beatles back in the 60s, yes. of various uh, swamis and yes. yogas and different people yes. who were representatives you of have having it. some in. Yeah. very profound insight into right. reality. Right. They've become very popular. I guess the, the most notorious one in recent years would be the uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Rajneesh. And yeah, he died recently. He died recently. And I think in uh, Oregon, at Rajneesh Puram, you had a lot of political problems. Mm -hmm. The municipality, local municipality. And people, I read in newspapers in India, people were against their continuing there. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, these are all there. But these are all parts of uh, uh, the bad effects of religion, I should say. I, well, people, I think what people have found is that the Western religions really aren't working too well for them, and they don't. They they still feel a need for some sort of religious support, uh, some sort of answer couched in religious terms. So they've been turning to to Eastern forms of of religion. And is, think, you're right. I think you have touched the right point. Uh, the religion has come to a dead end. And uh, when it has come to the dead end, either it should go further, beyond. So unless we humanity go beyond religion, otherwise on the road of religion, if you take a U-turn, you go back on the <laughs> same road you have come. So all this kind of fundamentalism and then uh, uh, the cultism and all that, I consider that is the U-turn. Humanity is people who follow religion are they are taking a U-turn on the road of religion. So we have to go beyond religion. That's why uh, some of us feel humanity as a whole is moving away from religion towards a post-religious society. So in search of that post-religious society, if they have bold enough, then they are becoming rationalists, atheists, agnostics, free thinkers and all that. If they don't have that courage, to go beyond religion towards post-religious society, then they are taking a U-turn. Yeah. Well, they, a lot of people seem to be caught up in the, the aspect of religion that it's supposed to be, in a sense, unfathomable. unfathomable. They're not supposed to really understand religion. Even in uh, the Judeo-Christian religion, there's a lot of mysteries and things that uh, are transcendent and or transcend reason and logic. And when they look at, at Eastern religions, they're not only looking at something, a whole body of knowledge in terms of the religious dogma that, are, that it's alien to them. They're also trying to cross a cultural gulf which makes the whole religion itself even more mysterious and ironically more attractive to them. Eastern religions are more individualistic, whereas the Western religion is more social. And in being social, majority of the white people might be feeling the burden of the white man because Christianity has not only promoted slavery among the people but it has caused so many wars. Mm -hmm. So today's younger people, white people, they are feeling uh, by following Christianity 
we have to carry the guilt on our backs. So let us turn to the people who were suppressed by the white people and see what the Eastern religions may give. In a way, I think um, they have a point, but it is not enough. You see, there is not much difference in the fundamentalism of Christianity or in the fundamentalism of Hinduism or Islam or Buddhism mm -hmm. or any fundamentalism. Any fundamentalism is bad. And any sectarianism, even though it is good, sectarianized good is worse than evil. Mm -hmm. So there is some good in every religion, I can't deny that. But that good when it is sectarianized as a religion and still it is uh, fundamentalized in fundamentalism, that it is doing more harm. That's why a time has come, people should have an open mind, should remove prejudice against atheism, humanism, free thought and all these things. They should discuss about it. If it is wrong, discard it. If there is something accepted, so some kind of a dialogue is necessary, some kind of uh, uh, understanding is necessary. But in today's world, people have no time to pause and understand. They have only time to follow blindly. Yes, it often seems like that, yeah. Well, one question I'd like to ask you, Lavin, um, this is not directly on the subject of, of uh, free thought, yeah. or, uh, but there's a, something going on in England, uh, India yeah. right now with uh, some, there's people, people have committed self-immolation yeah. uh, as a protest to uh, sort of a, a breaking down of the caste stratification and yeah. granting jobs to lower caste people. Could you yeah. give us a little insight into that? Yes, and yes, see, in India, untouchables are downtrodden. So the constitution has given job quota reservation system to untouchable scheduled caste, they are called, and then scheduled tribes, the tribes people who live in hills and then forests. Then the shudras, who are the mostly artisan people like washermen, like barbers, like blacksmiths, like porters, all these people, and they also want some kind of job quota system. And it is very, they say we are backward caste. In Indian society, who are backward caste, it is a bit difficult to this one. And then uh, in the name of caste, when job quota reservation is being demanded, there is a competition to be backward and mm -hmm. that's what's going on in India. Then the forward caste feel if the job quotas are reserved for about 60%, 70%, 80%, then the forward people would be only 20% and merit would lose its value. That's why they are opposing it. As an atheist, I have a solution to this one. I would say, let us have quota system. Whoever crosses the caste, whoever intermarries against the caste, then let him have. He may be forward caste, he may be backward caste, he may be Christian, he may be a Muslim, he may be a Hindu. So against the caste system, if quotas are given, I think we can easily find the solution. Otherwise, I am afraid India is very much in the midst of a caste war. Mm -hmm. And to bail India out of this caste war, the only solution is we have to work for anti-caste or I would even say post-caste society. We have to work for a post-caste society. Well, it seems like we're trying to get up by a lot of things, aren't we? We're looking, working for a post-religious society and a post-caste society. Uh, I guess that leads me into my next question uh, we can, to close out the program today. I'd like to know what your vision of uh, of the future is for, well, particularly for India, but also for the world, and how uh, you see uh, society in India progressing from the current uh, situation, which is pretty much dominated, really, I guess you have to admit, by, by relig various religious groups and the, the caste warfare you were talking about, and parallel systems around the world toward a, a, an ideal state in the future. Uh, how, how do we, what do you see as being that? that state and how would you do we get there from here between individual and universe whatever the divisions are there they are now slowly loosening so the caste religion nationality class they name they can no more solve any problem so that's why the individual human being and the universal human being these two are to be strengthened I think pretty soon we are traveling towards a world government and United Nations should be strengthened in this respect and in the Middle East we find that United Nations is playing a big role now. I think for me the future of the world is not at all bleak. It is on the other hand very bright. 
but for the time being the selfish forces and whose domination is being contained they are promoting fundamentalism they are promoting sectarianism they are promoting all sorts of uh, rumor mongering and all that but i feel we have a bright future for the world and the way for that bright future is we have to go beyond religion beyond nationalism and beyond every kind of sectarianism that divides human being from human being so individual from individual human being to universal human being in between the institutional human being is to be slowly lessened so the organized man from individual to universal organization there should be no in between religion as an organization state as an organization they all should be subservient to the universal organization i think we are going that way and i am very happy that uh, uh, when the turn of the century comes i think we will be on the threshold of some kind of a universal man and some kind of a world government mm -hmm. well now when you mentioned world government that's that's a sort of a sore topic in in the united states at least to a lot of uh, a lot of the religionists they don't they don't like any talk of a world government or any type of uh, authority uh, that crosses what are recognized as national boundaries now and may have authority over over really all of the the what are the current governments uh, do you find that same sort of resentment or that same feeling to be common among religionists in india in other uh, in other places also there would be some may not be to such a uh, uh, such an extent mm -hmm. but state will be there you see those who have been enjoying uh, some kind of gains out of the sectarianism they will not relish world government yeah that the downtrodden people for them even though the actions are local even though the problems are local the solutions are global You're right so even for our local problems we see global solutions and the global solutions can come when every individual becomes a universal man <laughs> and for that world government is necessary well i think we've got a, an interesting vision of the future there from lavanam and uh I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us again today. This has been Free Thinking 101. Once again, I'm Pat Ennis. Our guest has been Lavinam. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Welcome back. I hope you can make the show next time you're in town. Hope so. I will be here again <laughs> maybe next year. Okay, great. Uh, if the viewers would like to contact Lavinam or the Rationalist Society, they can uh, let's send us a letter to P.O. Box 2931, St. Louis, Missouri, 63130, or give us a phone call at area code 314-298-6649. Thanks for joining us.